The following program has been rated GE by the Kenya Film Classification Board. It is therefore suitable for general family viewing. Hello viewers, welcome to Chungu Chajami. I'm your host Eunice Mugo. Today on the show we are talking about nurturing the emotional intelligence in children. Do you nurture your emotional intelligence in children? What are the challenges? What are the importance that you face when you are interacting with your child closely? Send in your question, your comments across all our social media networks. That's GBS TV Africa or SMS line is 2144. I'm not alone. I have guests with me who are going to help us to understand better on how to bring our children with the better emotional intelligence for them to be better people in our society and in our family. I will allow them to introduce themselves. Welcome guests, starting with you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Pastor Silas Amandos. Uh, apart from being a pastor, I'm also an education officer and a motivational speaker. Thank you. Thank you on the show, Mr. Silas. And to you. Oh, thank you, Eunice. My name is Benjamin Mudoka. I'm a specialist in mind education. Welcome on the show, gentlemen. Uh, so today we are having a very interesting topic on how to nurture the emotional intelligence of our children. Um, in our society and in this current generation that we are in, the children are so much digitalized compared to us who are parenting them. Uh, thinking the millennials know internet, we find the Gen Z's know the internet more. And uh, the young children, today we are soothing our children with gadgets, internet, technology, information, the entertainment, everything that we do. Even for the television, we've gone to digital, so everything is so digitalized and inter technology. Um, when we are saying bringing or nurturing the emotional intelligence of a child. What are we talking about to start with, Mr. Silas? Uh, thank you so much. Huh? Uh, you, you realize that uh, a lot of focus has been put on the intelligence, and that is the aspect of the IQ. That's what uh, parents are focusing so much. Huh? Uh, and they are forgetting the aspect of the emotional intelligence. Because when you're talking about the emotional intelligence, you're looking at the aspect that uh, how one can be able to cope with his own feelings and also be able to handle and cope with the feelings of others. Because that becomes a challenge whereby does he or she understand his or her feelings very, very well. And also, apart from understanding her feelings, is he or she able to understand the feelings of others and how to manage? Mm -hmm. Yes. Coming to you, Mr. Benjamin, from a mind education specialist perspective, what, we, what is your take on the same about uh, what is nurturing a child in the uh, emotional intelligence way? For me, I would say uh, when we talk about mind education, mm -hmm. as I said, we are talking about the world of the heart. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the world of the heart, we are not talking about the organ that pumps our blood. We are talking about the inner person. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the mind. Mm -hmm. For example, if I may ask even our viewers, where is your heart? Where is your mind? Where is that inner person? Where does he stay? Does he stay in your hands? Does he stay in your brain? Does he stay in, in your stomach? Where is he? That's why it's a world that we have to learn, the world of the heart. And when we learn about the world of the heart, we are basing everything on three pillars which are very important. The ability to think deeply, contemplation. You have to contemplate about all the things that you do. And especially when you're thinking about yourself, there are three levels of thoughts. There is the first level, there is the second level of thought, and there is also the third level of thought. Mm -hmm. But mostly when I look at many people that I have seen, whether they are grown-ups, whether they are young people, mm -hmm. most of the people, they respond to the first level of thought. 
they meet a situation and then they respond to the first level of thought. Mm -hmm. Number two, we are talking about growing a strong heart in people. Because when, when, when your heart is settled on the foundation which is on a rock, mm -hmm. and I'll talk about a rock being God or Jesus or the word of God. Mm -hmm. these, these people have a very strong heart. Mm -hmm. But people who base everything according to they themselves, mm -hmm. what they think, what they see, what they feel, mm -hmm. they have a very weak heart. Number three, we are talking about change that comes from exchange. Mm -hmm. So you have to, the only way for you to change is when you exchange, when you communicate to other people, which is very key. And these are the things that we need to teach our children because this now, it's all about the world of the heart. Apart from that, we talk about the functions of the heart. The functions of the heart is something that, let's say for example, you have a very good mobile phone, but you don't know how to use it. You have a very good car which is lying at the garage, then it's useless if you cannot use it. Mm -hmm. God gave us a very special thing and a treasure which is the heart, the heart of man. Mm -hmm. But people don't know about that. That's why they do not even know how to use their heart, even though it's so precious and it is so special. That's why, for me, if I have to talk about the emotional question, I have to talk about the world of the heart. Thank you so much. Coming back to you, Mr. Silas. Yes. When we are talking about nurturing the emotional intelligence of a child, we have... Uh, People who are part and parcel of this child growing up, we have the society, we are the parents, we have the parents, we have the teachers, we have the caregivers. What role do they play in ensuring that this child have the proper emotional intelligence? Uh, thank you so much. Huh? Uh, one of the, I, I love the way you say that uh, we have different people that will take care. We have the, the, the parents, the caregivers, the teachers, the guard, and the society at large. You realize for us to make a child to become emotional, strong, and better, then it means that all these pillars have to come and work together. Because uh, as we look at, for example, those old days compared to the, the current days, uh, you find that those old days, it we used to be said that the child belongs to the society. So that was a duty of everyone to bring up this particular child. But the current generation we are living in is that this is my child. Therefore, you don't have any power to come in between. And you realize even the power has even been removed even from the teachers. Uh, that even, see there's a, a place the teachers are not able to reach. So for me, I, I look at it, the first person that should be able to help this particular child to nurture the emotions is the parent. Why? Because the first teacher of a child is the parent. It's the parent that stays with this particular child for longer. And this should not start at an older age, whereby most of us we shall say that maybe I'm waiting for my child to go to school so that he or she will be able to understand himself or herself. But we start at a tender age and realize that this particular child, even at, at age of one, mm -hmm. at age of two, they have their emotions. They have those emotions. And you realize that as small kids, uh, there are these kids that have what we call the, how do you call it, the, 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 the thunder trams, huh? mm -hmm. whereby uh, there is a way this child behaves, knowing that if I do this, I'm going to get see this particular attention. You see, that means at a tender age, they, they have the, the emotion part of it, because that is part and parcel of their life. So it's very, very important for us to come up together and agree as a society how we can be able to help this particular child. As a parent, what part do you need to play? So that as you, you push on this other side, I'm also able to pull on this other side so that we work as a team, not just to be done from one particular point. Because the challenge comes, you find that the way this child has been nurtured at home, and then he comes to school, you realize that the, the, uh, the, see, the teachers have a bigger role to play. They realize that this particular child, once he's addressed or talked to, there's a way they behave. Mm -hmm. The child may start crying or misbehaving mm -hmm. just because at home they is called ma mama or is called daddy. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you find that he, the child has really been pampered at home. Mm -hmm. Then it uh, then it becomes a challenge mm -hmm. for the parents to raise the uh, for the teachers mm -hmm. or the society at large to be able to raise this particular child. So I feel 
everything should start at home. Mm -hmm. Let parents take their responsibility, take their roles. But the challenge comes is that the parents of this generation, they are very busy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereby we have left uh, the gadgets to be in charge mm -hmm. and, the, and the house managers are the ones taking care of our children. Sure. Uh, so that becomes a bigger challenge because now you find that even a parent does not understand the character and the behavior of their own children. Mm -hmm. So the high thing is that being a parent, we must understand it's a res you must be ready to take the responsibility of taking care of your child and nurturing your child emotionally, mm -hmm. not just looking at the aspect of providing. Because most of us, we only feel is to provide the basic needs that are provided shelter, are provided food, are provided clothing, and any other thing to put the life of my child comfortable. But that is not all that is required. We need to step out and do the key thing of understanding who is my child. And the, 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 Benjamin has said, understanding the heart, how does it function? It's very, very important because there's the thought process of this particular child. And you are the first person to, to be able to understand and know this is how my child behaves. And this is the way I want him or her to grow to be. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, You've mentioned something interesting about the tantrums that our children raise whenever they want something. Um, Benjamin, coming to you as I put you also on the ring light, correct me if I'm wrong, but also you as a pastor, uh, most of the time when we are praying, we are told pray without ceasing, or rather, even the Bible says that we should be having a heart of a child. From my understanding, I allow to be corrected, I understand it's because of how a child persists. If you promise your child today that you're going to buy a ball when you're going back home, they'll be full of expectance and uh, knowing that uh, my father's not going to fail me, he'll surely going to bring a ball. But what happens when you don't bring a ball? They'll be nagging you until you tell them a proper reason that will resonate with them as to why you did not bring a ball. The same way we are being told whenever we are praying or asking for something. Now my question comes in, in these tantrums, and what, at what age are we supposed now to start um, molding our children and correcting whenever they're doing wrong without also putting down their, or bringing down their courage of speaking out what they want. And um, when we are correcting them, you, you, you said something to do with tantrums. Most of the time we feel when you're going for shopping, when you're going somewhere, a child brings tantrums when they want your attention or they want something in particular. Knowing that if you're in a supermarket, utaki aibu. So if he starts crying, you'll buy everything he or she wants. So at what time do you start molding this child to tell them, when we are going to the supermarket, what we did not agree we are buying, we are not going to buy. And it to be understood that you're not denying them, but rather it's upon an agreement that we agreed before we left. Uh, one, we have to understand there is something we call desire and self-control. Uh, most of the time, we do not know, and that's why I'm talking about the world of the heart. And, you know, one time King Solomon spoke and then he said like this, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So all the issues of life that we meet, they all originate from the heart. And when we talk about desire and self-control, mm -hmm. desire is something that is in our hearts. Mm -hmm. But self-control does not come with, from within us. That's why we have to learn self-control. Mm -hmm. For example, if I have a very good car with a high-performing engine, but the brakes are so loose, then I don't think whether anyone could be saying that I am safe in that car. It's like you're walking, you, or rather you're traveling in a coffin. If the brakes are very okay, it doesn't matter how powerful the engine is, then you can move very safe. 
So when we talk about desire, everybody is born with desire. But the problem is, your desire will grow as you grow. And most of the time, it surpasses the ability of the parents. For example, as a parent, when your child is very young, they're just like uh, toddlers. You give them a sweet and 200 Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. They will go for the sweet. Mm -hmm. That is their desire. But as they continue to grow, the desire grows with them and then it surpasses the ability of the parents. Mm -hmm. But now problem is, the problem is this. At this point, it's when now they need to know that there must be self-control. Mm -hmm. And this self-control is like breaks. It's not everything that you need that you need to receive. But the parents of today, do they really know how to teach their children about self-control? For them, as my brother Silas said, they want to, it's kind of, I want to, because I do not have even time to talk to my kids, mm -hmm. I'll give them whatever they want. Yeah. Oh, you want a smartphone? They give. Oh, you want money? They give. Why? So that it becomes like a replacement of my time with the kids. So as they grow, they don't know anything about self-control. The reason why you see now many people, young people, are committing suicide is not because they really want to commit suicide. It's simply because when they were growing up, they were not given a chance to learn about self-control. So their desire is too high, but they do not have self-control. It's a car that has no brakes. It will kill you, I'm telling you. So the desire that man has, he has to be taught on how to have self-control. And that's why now we come to the world of the heart. We have to learn. Yes, we have this special heart in us, and in that special heart that we have, there are functions of that heart that we have. Mm -hmm. Number one of them is emotions. And one of the most scary, scary thing or scary person that you have to live with is a person who relies on their emotions. There are times that you wake up and then you're feeling so sad for no reason. Mm -hmm. There are times that you wake up and then you are so happy. Mm -hmm. Why are you happy? No reason. So if people do not know exactly the functions of their heart, then they just leave and then they become so scary people. And that's why now from there, we go to the second function of the heart, which is reasoning. The reason why we go to school, it's because we are now learning how to reason. And that's why for you, you cannot reason with a primary kid. They will talk and talk and talk and then at some point you feel like that is their level. My level is not at that point. Where did this come from? It came from education. From there, when we are in school, let's say for example we come out of school and then we go to college or university, we graduate, then from there we always listen to great people and politicians and then they're giving us the third function of the heart which is hope. They're giving you a lot of hope, and then the problem is that this one, you're given hope by politicians and great people. Even maybe, to some extent, there are people who are seeing Eunice as a very great woman. Mm -hmm. She's on TV, mm -hmm. so they're getting a lot of hope when they look at you. But the problem is that this hope also reaches a point, and then it escalates to despair. Because I waited for a long Too time, long. So I fall into despair. Mm -hmm. And then from there, that's where now it comes to the point that people get isolated. You hear people committing suicide. You hear people becoming drug addicts because they had a great hope, but nothing was yielding from that. And then later, that's when now they need the fourth function of the heart, which is the mind, which is now mind education, which is now the world of the heart. They have to learn how to have self-control. That's why, for me, when I think about this thing, mm. parents themselves, they do not know about self-control. Like, for example, we are talking about the Generation Z, not the, not the millennials or... But for me, I did not learn about self-control. How can I teach my children about self-control? 
For me, desire is killing me. I don't have self-control. And then how do you expect me to teach my children about self-control? That's why we have yeah. chaos in the society, chaos in the families. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, a, a yes or no answer. Is it, uh, you say, we, do, we can't give what you don't have, which is true. And uh, I cannot teach what I have not been taught. So does this mean that I have to go to school to learn self-control? Or where am I learning from? Self-control. Self-control, when we talk about self-control, we have to think about the world of the heart. And then who can, you know, I'm sorry, because most of the time when I talk, I talk, and then I quote about the Bible. <laughs> then the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. Who knows that his heart is deceitful above all things? People trust in that heart which God says is deceitful above all things. That's why for them to learn, people left God and then they want to struggle. You know. I have a question as you answer that when you're coming after this break. Maybe putting you a on the dream light, since mm -hmm. both of you are talking from the biblical perspective as a pastor, mm -hmm. um, borrowing what he's just said, uh, the Bible says that the heart of man is uh, always on the wrong. Mm -hmm. So if the heart of man is always wrong, and they have to learn from you as the man of God, or someone, or a mentor, someone that mm -hmm. I'm looking up to, mm -hmm. if I cannot trust my own heart, why should I trust your heart then? That is what I would want us to, what I would want you to answer and also get to, get your perspective on the same. Mm -hmm. If I cannot trust my own heart as Eunice, why should I trust your heart as Silas and follow what you say I should do and trust that what you're telling me is right as my mentor, as my leader, as my senior, depending on the platform? If my heart is wrong, what makes me think that what I tell my child is right and expect them to follow the same? Viewer, I hope you're learning as much as I am. Interact with us across all our social media networks. That's GBS TV Africa. Our SMS line is 2 the 4 We'll be back shortly. <laughs> 